Chinese countries, I mean, the corporations we know well, like General Electric, like ExxonMobil in China, in India? Well, I can tell you, for example, that General Electric is funding a large research effort uh, based in Shanghai on developing coal technologies that capture the carbon dioxide and sequester it under the ground rather than putting it into the atmosphere. That effort is one of many across China looking at advanced coal technologies that can do this crucial trick of capturing the carbon dioxide rather than letting it into the atmosphere. Same thing is happening in India. Research on these technologies is also going on in the United States, of course, and it's expanding rapidly. And what's most interesting and what I'm quite extensively involved in is cooperation among these countries. The United States, China, and India, in many respects, are starting to work together on how to develop and deploy these technologies which will keep the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. What do you think is the answer here? Well, I think the answer, first of all, is for the world to agree under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which goes forward and has negotiations every year and will embrace in 2009 and in Copenhagen a new set of rules for the whole world. It's important that we have a global agreement on how we are going to limit the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases going forward and an agreement that will include the tropical forests, that will include ways to transfer some of the revenues from carbon taxes or carbon emission permits in the north to pay for reduced deforestation in the south. We need a variety of measures in this global agreement going forward which will get everybody on the same page and which will lead to the global emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases starting to decline in absolute terms no later than 2020. That's the sort of trajectory we have to be on. Instead of increasing, and the business as usual path forward, by the way, if we keep doing what we're doing, we will double those emissions over the next 50 years. And what we need to do instead is have those emissions sharply declining over the next 50 years, and that can be done. The technologies either exist or are in the advanced stages of development to get that done. The moment we put real limits and real charges on carbon dioxide emissions, we will see a surge of innovation that will discover even better ways for reducing those emissions. We will see new jobs and new wealth created as we convert our energy economy to a clean one rather than a dirty one. We will see new jobs and new income created in sustainable uses of tropical forests rather than cutting them down. The notion that this is going to be unaffordable and an economic catastrophe to address this problem is just wrong. How dangerous was it to this country and the world that the U.S. unsigned Kyoto, that President Bush uh, would not sign the Kyoto Treaty? Well, the, the, the Kyoto Treaty was actually signed by the United States in Kyoto, but it was never ratified. And what President Bush said is, we're never going to ratify it. I won't even submit it to the Senate for ratification. This was a big blow to United States leadership and credibility in the world on this issue. The Kyoto Protocol was only a first step. It was a baby first step, but it was the first substantial effort by the world community to come together on the beginnings of a solution. And for the United States to say, we will not participate, was a blow to the prospects for global cooperation going forward. It cost us a huge amount of credibility, cost a huge amount of momentum that the United States refused to join this. President Bush said, you know, I'll give you an alternative uh, to Kyoto, and it'll be better. But what President Bush announced in 2002 was really no alternative at all. It, what he announced in 2002 was essentially the continuation of business as usual in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Do you see any hope in the presidential candidates today? Oh, I see huge hope. Both of the presidential candidates, Senator Obama and Senator McCain, have expressed their commitment to sharply reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions uh, over the decades ahead. And I believe they both mean it. Mandatory? Senator Mandatory. Mandatory, economy-wide. Uh, and I believe they both meet it. Steve yeah, Sussman. Let me just add that if China and India won't follow our leadership in exercising self-restraint, our country is not powerless to deal with them. We're ta Congress is talking now about passing laws that make it unlawful for members of OPEC to conspire to fix the price of, of oil and gas, <clears throat> claiming this conspiracy is not 
occurring in the United States. It's occurring offshore. But Congress is going to pass a law that probably gives American courts jurisdiction over activity abroad that hurts Americans here. Why is global warming any different? They could pass a law that gives courts in the United States jurisdiction over Chinese or Indian companies that are building these dirty coal plants. Now, now India and China, they have to pay any judgments that are entered by our courts because they sell millions of dollars of products to the United States. They all have big bank accounts that can be attached. So they're going to have to pay any judgments that are rendered. All we have to have is Congress give jurisdiction. And is that fair? If the Chinese put up a satellite, a private company in China put up a satellite, and it fell on your house and injured someone, would you have a claim against them in American courts? You should. I mean, why is that so different than, you know, pointing a rifle from one state into the other state and killing someone? I mean, they caused harm in the United States, they should be subject to jurisdiction in the United States, and Congress can do that with a bill. And, and then they will pay attention. So we don't have to just ask and beg. We can make them. But by the way, my guess is that we won't have to, because again, these countries have come to recognize that climate change is harming them. It's in their self-interest. It's not simply that the United States might uh, impose sanctions against them if they fail to participate in a global approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. They understand that if they fail to participate, a global approach will, will not be truly global and it will fail and the consequences for their own countries will be disastrous. If you look at the projections going forward of what we expect in terms of increases in heat waves, increases in floods, increases in droughts, increases in wildfires, it is a picture that nobody should want to live in. And the Chinese and the Indians are coming to understand that. And as everybody comes to understand it, we are going to come together on a solution, a set of solutions to this problem. On that note, I want to thank you both for being with us. Um, Stephen Sussman, founding partner of the law firm Sussman Godfrey, recently filed a pioneering global warming lawsuit against ExxonMobil, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and 20 other oil, coal, and electric companies on behalf of residents of the Alaska native coastal village of Kevalina. And John Holtron, professor of environmental policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, director of the Woods Hole Research Center, just completed a term as board chair of the American Association for the Advancement of science. And I want to thank all the folks here at Grassroots TV, Public Access Television in Aspen for hosting us for the last two days. John Masters and um, Rai Zupensis, also Brad Manasevitz and Ellen Winter and Jack Minton, Ian Fellerman, Katie Carson, Sabrina Cargis, Brenda Mura, Dennis Moynihan uh, in New York, uh, Sharif Abdokadus, Mike Burke, Aaron Mate, Jeffrey Hagerman, Steve Martinez, Anjali Comet. I also want to thank Nicole Salazar and and Peter Curries uh, for being our director today, uh, as well as Miguel Nagara, Mike DeFilippo, and all the team that makes Democracy Now! happen every single day. A remarkable crew it is. Also, a very happy birthday to Isis Phillips. Tomorrow, again, a special on Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Our website, democracynow.org, for a copy of today's show. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.